Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, it feels like Friday, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> sadly. Um, yeah, welcome back to another uh, freshly squeezed episode of Peak A's on Air with me in the, at least this time, virtual studio. Uh, again, is non Anna than Dominique Seppelt. Welcome Dominique, back. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. So um, I'm having a very uh yeah interesting week in front of me i mean it already started but uh we are completely into content ideation content conceptualization and it, i'm i'm yeah super excited uh that we are having like pretty interesting projects going on at the moment so everything is fine how are you good 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 yeah i can't i can't complain either i mean as you said uh being busy is probably also a good thing it's still yeah. very sunny in germany uh so well my air condition is working let's put it that way um <laughs> no i'm i'm actually yeah it's, it's the weather is great it's a lot of work but that's that's a good thing as you said um so yeah, I would say all in all, um, a good week. Things looking a bit more friendly, um, I would say, in the uh, in the outside world. Also, when it comes to kind of search and business in general. Um, so yeah, as you said, exciting projects. All good, all good. Also quite excited about uh, this week's episode. Actually, I mean, we have a bunch of cool topics. I think as we teased already last week, um, we're gonna discuss. A bit about uh, maybe uh, just share a bit of our thoughts and I'm, I'm curious where, where you stand on some of those um, mm -hmm. in in regards to you know SEO and content is that like a versus user experience is it maybe not so much a versus anymore you know what what's what's the things that um, that have changed in the last year so yeah I put together like a very very quick uh, couple of couple of slides so I think this is uh, kind of our our main our main thing for today. But then, yeah. uh, I mean, there were also a couple of other quite exciting developments, uh, as always, uh, during the week. So we're going to touch on that as well. Um, I think what works better this time is at least we managed to fix YouTube. So from wherever you're watching, uh, we should be uh, at least hopefully live on on Facebook, on YouTube again, um, on Twitter. On Twitch, so we get we're getting there. We're still having, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're still having our um, let's say battles with uh, LinkedIn, but uh, I'm I'm sure we will manage eventually. Also, um, a quick thanks for some feedback again that we got from last week's episode, and um, some things were already on our um, kind of radar or on our list, but uh, I think a lot of people were asking actually, you know, what's you mentioned these you mentioned these show notes, but where the hell do we actually <laughs> find them? And that's a very, a very fair and very honest. Um, um, we didn't do so well, kind of a answer, I would say. So we, I mean, we have show notes. Yeah. We had show notes. We always added them below the YouTube uh, videos when we kind of publish them. But obviously, that's not the greatest place in the world um to kind of have them sit so yeah sorry for sorry for that i think that was not entirely clear so we did a couple of um changes i think that's uh, that's what it is really so i'm going to quickly show you if my screen sharing works um one second mm -mm -mm. so we did something like this so this is gonna be um and i hope that works but it should be um yeah so we we did a bit of a, a recap um i don't know why it looks a bit funny like this now but yeah there we go so it holds the video it holds a, a very brief summary obviously and most importantly it holds also like all the links that we kind of mentioning during the show so we will be usually publishing them kind of the day after the show um and what we also did is basically you will kind of now in the future um, find them all in all in one place. So I think this is um, probably also kind of a good uh, well a good thing or at least um, should make it a bit easier. So show notes um, of all the episodes kind of starting from from last week onwards um, pa.ag/notes and then you get like the overview you can pick 
whatever um, episode you kind of were referring to, and then you have them all there in one place. So we will be using this to, I mean, not only have links, but also add slides or uh, infographics yeah. or whatever we kind of are discussing during the show, uh, sometimes giving a bit of comments. But yeah, so this is kind of how we think it might make it a bit easier to follow because that feedback was very valid. I'm sorry that we didn't manage earlier. We still haven't, um, let's say, embedded PKs on air properly on some of the uh, PKs properties. I would say that's something that's uh, still on the list. I also, um, there's a new feature. I'm going to try and see if this works. So there are now comments popping in. And uh, Mali is there. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> ha, that works. So yeah, um, fantastic. That works really well. So yeah, feel free to leave us uh, comments on Facebook <laughs> and all the other channels uh, because we can now easily show them. Uh, so that makes it a bit easier um, and a bit more interactive. So yeah, feedback, comments, always welcome. Um, as always, we are looking forward to reading you. Um, so that said, uh, I think we kind of should get started with just a couple of thoughts um, that I put together um, on the UX versus or you know UX and SEO topics. I just need to quickly reshare another screen um, and then hopefully. Mm -mm -mm. Yep. It's this should work. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yep. So presentation mode is working, huh? Perfect. Great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is always, this is always a, a very exciting yeah. uh, moment. As you all know, if you have done virtual presentations for some funny reasons, it works 10 times and the 11th is doesn't. But yeah, so we, we are there. Um, again, just a couple of my thoughts and a bit of kind of looking back um, to when I actually started, and I, I thought I should probably start with a with a confession. Um, and uh, I'm sure gonna, Dominique is going to enjoy that one, but I am actually really old. I mean, um, I, I might not always look like it. Uh, now I do. But, um, yeah, it's 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 clearly that when I started, um, that was quite a while ago, actually. And um, Google somehow looked like this, um, which was really really funny. So that was kind of end of the end of the 90s, really, um, when I kind of got um, in touch with or like started playing with this uh, relatively unknown search engine at the time, 25 million pages, which was literally nothing. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was quite funny. And um, we, back in the day, even had a left-hand navigation. Um, and I, I still kind of recall this uh, outcry that was there when uh, kind of Google decided to, to, to take it away. And uh, if you recall one of our earlier episodes uh, of PK Sonia, when we kind of were discussing some of the more uh, COVID related changes to mm -hmm. the search results, I think one of the things that we talked about a lot, Dominique, was the, like, the kind of reintroduction, if you so will, yeah. of this left-hand navigation yeah. uh, in terms of like filter functionality and I kind of you know jump marks through the search results. So yeah, we actually had that. It was just a very, very long time ago. Um, <laughs> Quite, quite, quite funny. Um, so, <laughs> so funny to see that that image because I just know that from the like the, the archive time machine. Whenever mm -hmm. I go back to see like like Google search or any kind of websites from yeah. I don't know, 20, 20 years ago, uh, that's the only way I, I know that kind of image. So funny. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really old. I mean, let's let's not even start and talk about the the results themselves. But I found it quite fascinating that I mean, there yeah. were some things there, some things went away. Everyone was like, "Why is like where's the navigation? Now it's gone. I can't use it anymore." Uh, now, now we have it. We have it somehow back. So that was that was quite funny, which was also kind of the time. So I um, I mean, another. I'm not sure if that's even a confession, but <laughs> I um so I spent like. A bit more than two years at a company called Jamba um, or Jamstar for the um, English speaking regions. And um, so this is actually taken from, and you can see it on the format, it was still like those four and three um, PowerPoint decks uh, back in the day. And um, this is actually uh, a slide that I used to, uh, to explain SEO uh, kind of to C level or like people that were not so familiar. Uh, with 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 search in, in in general and especially like the organic side, so it kind of at the time uh, came down to you know just you know, building some kind of simplified 
HTML building um, and then creating new content on a, on a very high frequency without really caring about quality. I mean, that was still um, post kind of those quality algorithm changes that we that we saw. And then at the end of the day, it was it was mainly about links, right? So the sheer scale of links was what had the most uh, the most impact at the time, right? So yeah, long 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 time ago. And, and and at that point in time, I would have said like, well, what what do you want? Like, what what is UX even? Why should we? Why should I care? Right? Mm -hmm. I I at the time, honestly, I probably have to say I have not cared at all because at the end of the day, well, it was ranking, so it couldn't have been that bad, right? Um, yeah. But I I guess I mean um, so yeah. As I said, like it, it kind of it, it was ranking, so all good. Uh, that was probably as SEOs as much as we cared but i guess i mean those times kind of are long gone and and things obviously change so um and then i kind of started digging further in, in some of the presentations that i did over the last years and actually uh in 215 so oh well, still again almost like five years ago um i started using uh, one of those slides where well i kind of went a bit more in the direction of you know what should you do um to make your site rank well, just generally speaking, not so much from a strategic perspective and start tying in kind of some of the usability metrics. And I still recall, um, of course, sitting with the team, I think back in the day, it was uh, Steffen and, and Lutz from our teams uh, where we started creating some of those examples, uh, saying, for example, you know what, like it would be also good if you as an SEO would kind of understand the basic like known usability principles just because that also helps from an SEO perspective, right? So in this case, it was about readability. So if you look on the left, obviously that's something that's that's incredibly hard to read. Therefore, um, I'm not saying directly, but you know potentially that might also make it harder to use the site, and therefore potentially you know, it could also have an impact on your on your organic um, search performance or uh, something like this right so where kind of we were talking about you know if you have links then it would also be good if you make them click friendly otherwise why and how should people use it and we all know that you know google uses some kind of traffic patterns um, and user behavior metrics to kind of understand you know how is someone for example navigating through a site so again kind of understanding those basic known principles uh, from a ux perspective that would probably help your your seo as well right so and again that was that was five years ago. Um, however, I also have to say uh, some of those things that happen on the UX side, but I mean, that's probably true for all channels, right? There are always some, some funny things where you're like, what the hell is what the hell is going on here? So one of the examples that we had in this, uh, in the presentation was this. So this is like taken from one of the larger German banks. And what they did is uh, they had a desktop site, uh, the relaunch in that case. And then they used this uh, tiny burger navigation on the left-hand side for desktop. And then all of a sudden, someone was kind of complaining about the fact that, well, you know, uh, people don't understand that the website is not being used properly anymore. And even worse, uh, at the time, it was the case that some links have been had been left out. And there was, again, way um, pre-mobile first indexing, right? So parity um, uh, kind of mattered uh, even more. And if you on your desktop site would just strip out the links, well, I mean, those sites, those sub pages obviously can't link anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, some of those things were just really like, because it was just trendy at the time to use burger uh, navigations for everything and anything, I think that's also the danger, right? Just following that stuff blindly. Uh, again, not only from a UX perspective, but also from an SEO perspective was not really a great idea. And they they started really to push on various topics, um, somewhat somewhat in parallel, right? So there was an um, I recall we did an article that was in 2018, um, and it was titled, um, you know, will time on site become the most important KPI or most important uh, SEO KPI? And I recall that there were some well respected colleagues uh, kind of contributing to this. I think Philip Klöckner was one of them, uh, Marcus Tandler from Right. Um, myself and we kind of like I, what i said in the time was like that i think that google somewhat uses a combination of several metrics right because often people were saying like okay this one individual metric is not what's being used and i would i would agree um so it was often or in, in my mind it's a it's a combination of multiple things 
um, because also, I mean, there can be types of sites for uh, where there's, you know, where potentially like a short time on site is actually a good thing, right? Because you kind of found what you wanted and then you just left um, going to, to another page. So I think it's not this one off, but generally speaking, and this is what we said here, like that I, and I said as well, like I think that for example, bounce rate, click through rate and views per session, um, they have very different effects kind of depending on the vertical, but they are all like equally important. And of course with um, kind of machine learning in play, Google can understand that even better and at a way larger scale. So at that point I was quite convinced already that that kind of, you know, looking at metrics, not only purely from an SEO perspective, but more so from a UX perspective uh, as well, certainly is not a bad thing if you want to rank properly um, kind of going forward. And, and I mean, there's more, right? So this is kind of all the stuff that happened in the past. And I mean, this is a slide I've been using a lot and it's still true, um, but I am quite impatient. And one of the funny things um, that happened when when kind of GDAPR came came out um, or kind of had been put on, put into effect, let's put it let's put it that way, is um, this is an example that I um, kind of put together. USA Today, obviously being a US publication, uh, but having a kind of European readership, what they did is they had to basically make their site uh, GD GDPR compliant at the time. And the interesting part was that. Basically, what they did is they did a copy of the page, um, put it on a subdomain, in this case, like eu.usatoday.com, uh, and they kind of stripped out uh, all advertisement, all cookies, uh, and mostly all of the JavaScript, because this was all just only there, or like, let's say, 90-ish percent there, just for the sake of either tracking or ad delivery or whatnot. And obviously, that was all not GDPR compliant, so they just kind of trimmed it down entirely. And, and the metric and the difference of those was absolutely mind-blowing, right? So if you look at the site um, and you compare the table left and right, um, this this entire site was basically, uh, you know, it was 350 kilobytes in a result versus five megabytes. So this like four and a half something megabytes just came, came from advertisement yeah. cookies and JavaScript bloat. So that European site actually made really, like was very, very nice to use. The rest was just a pain because, I mean, if you have a load time of like 19 seconds it's just it, it's horrible right oh. so um and i mean that that nielsen study which is i mean probably still one of my go-to statistics uh, that's there and i think google is even more like harsh on the mate and the metrics um also if you look into um into uh, kind of their tools basically so the thresholds is even lower but I think as a as a benchmark, um, you literally have only two seconds, right? So 19 seconds, no one is ever is ever going to wait. And even with with two seconds and slightly above, you kind of lose uh, half of your half of your potential audience. Um, so I think quite significant um, um, to to understand that people are just um, not patient and not willing to wait forever. So I I was saying that like for a long time, especially in like a lot of the talks that I did around web performance, uh, it's not it's not an SEO play. Um, it certainly helps in SEO, that, that's for sure, right? So, I mean, if you deliver uh, pages relatively quickly, that, of course, means that, you know, you get, you get better use in terms of the crawler can download more pages in this, in this kind of uh, bucket of time that you have. So, of course, that helps because they can, they can kind of crawl faster and therefore more pages. But first and foremost, it should be uh, UX play. And um, I think... I mean, Google has been quite vocal about that, at least kind of indirectly already, again, to 10, where they said, well, we're using site speed and, and web ranking. And they kind of, I would say, repeated it, let's say, in, in 218, where um, they kind of said, well, this is also true, obviously, for uh, mobile sites, right? So for the mobile um, results. And one of the new things that just has been recently introduced is uh, what's called fast page labeling. Um, so this is only working in the kind of latest version of Chrome, so 85. But if you use it on Android, um, and if you are clicking, but not, I mean, not clicking, but if you tap on a link and you not release it instantly, you would see like this label um, where Google is basically telling you um, if that result that you are basically navigating to um, is expected to load fast or not. Um, so I think kind of this 
I think I have been like quite vocal on saying that I would think that they might even add something like that into the search results, um, saying like, you know, similar to AMP where we have this uh, this icon that says, well, this is an AMP page and therefore it's supposed to be fast. I was expecting that to happen, but I guess um, they decided to move even one level upper and do it straight in the um, in the browser, which is uh, an interesting an interesting way. Um, let's see, I'm curious how that kind of is going to change over time, right? And I think the last thing that kind of happened um, was end of May. And uh, yeah, if you have missed that, I guess the quick recap is that Google now, because we have seen a whole bunch of performance-related metrics um, kind of put to put to life in the last mm, 12 to 24 months, kind of. And it, it got really confusing up to a point where we have like, I would say 10 plus metrics, especially when we're doing audits and whatnot that we had to look at. And what Google did is they tried to at least simplify it and also provide, provide some guidance along the way, um, kind of focusing on, on three metrics, which they kind of bundle and call the core web vitals. Um, and the goal is kind of to evaluate this perceived uh, user and page experience. And perceived is the important word here because, well, a, a page can potentially load relatively fast, but it still feels slow. So the perceived speed is something that's that's super important. And, and this is also why it kind of um, has been split into, into different sections. So um, LCP or the largest contentful piece in the, oh, yeah, piece, paint. Largest contentful paint um, in this case is basically reflecting kind of how quickly do you manage to get the most important visual element mm -hmm. painted to the site. Um, the second metric, FID, or like the first input delay, is trying to reflect how fast your site is interactive. So this, like, you, I think, have experienced that as well. Like, you go to a site, and then the site is somewhat frozen, even though it's there, and you can you can tap, you can click, but nothing happens. So this is mm -hmm. kind of what input delay is trying to reflect. And then lastly, uh, one of the super annoying things um, is uh, the is kind of in, is put into CLS, so the, uh, cumulative layout shift. So the idea there is that your website layout should be stable, right? If you turn it around, what happens oftentimes, if uh, you load something and then um, it's, in, it's it's kind of asynchronously, so some other element comes in later and then the site starts to, or elements on the site start to move around, right? So images jump or you want to click on a link and that link all of a sudden because the font size changes or like the font type changes is not there anymore. So this is kind of what is in, uh, in this, layout shift metric and and all of those three together is what they what they call the the core web vitals and this kind of package if you so will is um google trying to say okay this is not solely speed but it's it's more user experience because you know if something moves around then that's annoying it's not necessarily because of fast or slow but it's just because how you feel about using it and google kind of um, wants to evaluate, evaluate a site against that and just try to understand if users have, you know, a poor experience and therefore then consider uh, to rank that not as high as it, if you use a kind of the classic ranking uh, uh, signals they look at. Um, so you might kind of lose out if you don't manage to perform well with core web vitals. So I think this is kind of what, what it is and it kind of reflects the push in my opinion towards like baking user experience um, into the search algorithms um, and, and trying to reflect the importance there as well. So it's it's kind of not this just moving uh, with the, like the SEO glasses on and just saying, well, this is what we need in S from SEO perspective, but trying to make sure that you get like the UX view in there as well. And I think oftentimes, or at least sometimes we do things for search engines, but for some reason, I mean, they almost always require those things because they have learned it, right? So with machine learning and others. So this is actually what their users really want. So in, in my mind, um, and this is kind of the end of the, like a, a quick overview on things in my mind, I think those things really are coming um, together or are almost um, kind of together already. Um, I think what's still unclear is I suppose how strong is the impact of that? I guess that's then another discussion and also something that's going to be probably very hard 
to measure, like at least isolated measure. I think I've seen some follow-up post on, on one of the bigger publications um, where I think Gary Ilch was quoted saying from, from Google saying, well, he can't imagine this to become a primary ranking factor just yet, which I think is not a surprise. I mean, if we look mm -hmm. at um, other like smaller signals, I think I would like to kind of compare it with you know, let's say the HTTPS, which also wasn't really as like a measurable impact. Same is true for speed as as such, right? It would be very hard to isolate and see, you know, is that really due to this or due to that? So I guess a primary factor, something such as links or uh, others, that might be hard to beat with this. But I think it certainly shows uh, a push into like trying to get those fields more together. Yeah. Having less of this single channel view this is at least my take um mm -hmm. where i think it makes a lot of sense actually so yeah um i'm not sure what you think i mean you probably experienced that somewhat the same when when you kind of are creating content assets right and um then the question is you know is it and i think we talked about measurement in the past as well so is it i mean is solely links the right answer? Probably not, right? Or just engagement when maybe it's also, maybe it's also, you know, how users are actually using that specific content asset that you build, right? And I think that somewhat goes into the same direction. Yeah, definitely. It's it's exactly the same whenever we are into content campaigning or talking about content campaigns. So no matter how great your content is, I would say when the user cannot access the content or read it or even share it easily, they, they won't engage with it, right? And yeah. I think the part of engaging with the content, this is the major part um, when we talk about KPIs and content marketing, of course, mm -hmm. uh, building up like, like backlinks and whatever, is, it's a good topic and nice to have when, when the content deserves it. But um, everything in terms of engagement, if it's like sharing and, and comments and whatever, and like the, the interactivity when using the content is the major part over there. And so that's why, the, the UX also in, in content marketing is a huge topic, especially when we talk about interactive content, of course. Yeah. I was gonna say, especially for those pieces where you actually can have some type of interaction in there, right? Definitely, um, yeah. yeah. yeah, no, I, so, yeah I, 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 would, I agree. Yeah, yeah. so bad, bad UX can can kill the, the best content. So we saw that in, in so many cases, whenever we have like building up any mock-ups or, or drafts for, for content campaigns. I remember one situation, I think you were in the, in the same meeting, it's like years ago and uh, we were designing an interactive content campaign. It was something like an Europe map or something like this, but mm -hmm. we, we um, in the design period, period, we didn't thought about the, um, the header of our, of our um, landing page we have. So we just thought about the- Oh the yeah, I recall that, yeah. And then we, we just saw the, the purely um, design of the interactive campaign. And then we thought, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it could work. But what if you embed it on our landing page? Mm -hmm. Will anybody see the navigation from the, uh, yeah. of the, of the <laughs> interactive? Yeah, yeah, I recall what you mean, yeah. And yeah. then we just embedded it for testing and we saw, okay, nobody will ever recognize that there are any kind of filters and whatever yeah. it, that was like, ah, okay, makes sense to yeah. also think about topics like this or like like mark everything like when you have something like hover functions or clicking buttons and whatever when you you need to explain whenever you have like interactive content you need to explain yeah. it to the to your audience right so yeah. um and also that's a pretty pretty strong part in content marketing so highlighting that that uh, things or when it's super complicated we also in some cases work with those those um pop up tool tips whatever to just mm -hmm. explain the content from the very beginning to the user when there are like tons of functionalities it yeah. just help because otherwise the user will just take a look on it and we're searching for the small x wherever yeah, it is goodbye. Nah. yeah to just leave the the website or the landing page yeah so yeah, I, I I totally I totally agree, and I think from a if you if we go even like if we zoom out further like into this kind of bird's eye perspective, I think what I was um, saying like even with in this article like in, I think it was mid two thousand eighteen or something, I think one of the mistakes that people actually make is really just trying to understand like or, or trying to dissect single isolated factors. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and sadly our industry and some specifically have not been very thorough with what they call like their ranking factor studies, if that makes any sense. But, uh, I Your think they, they, 
<laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yes and no, right? Because it's it's I understand where they're coming from. I understand what they're trying to do, but you know, if you work against a black box, I can yeah. I cannot see and we experience the same thing with our PK's test lab. Um, yeah. which is not about ranking factors, but just about general output of technical things that we test against like a control group. Um, it's it, it's incredibly hard. And then those tests can be ruined by so many different things that I would not go on the limb and say, well, this is a ranking factor in that sense. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is also from like the UX uh, kind of perspective, I would say, is that, you know, it it's... In the grand scheme of things, I think if you think in a way and say, well, if that works for that person that I want to have on that landing page and that person understands this page and then uh, completes what's your goal for them to complete, you know, and that can be reflected in various like bunches of, of like micro and macro um, uh, conversions and metrics, right? That can be just a simple... KPIs such, such as time on site, but can be also goal completion um, all the way through. That certainly is not bad for your SEO. The other way around, I think, is if that's not the case and no one understands it, and as you said, uh, similar to content assets, everyone and their mother is just leaving straight away, that might not be, uh, especially given machine learning algorithms that do understand those patterns with mm -hmm. a certain volume, um, that yeah. might not be something that's very much sustainable. So I think it, it totally makes sense. Um, and that it's not only that's not only like simple things, but it just from a from a bird's eye perspective, it totally makes sense to involve UX teams very, very early on, because especially now I feel that it's it's also become a bit easier um just due to the fact that um so th let's take mobile first indexing, for example, right? So we always had this the issue that um when like some of the UX people, and I don't mean like any um, any offense, said, like, "Well, we would rather like want to hide this content and then just expand it if someone mm -hmm. searches it." I totally, I totally, totally get where they're coming from. But yeah. then, from an SEO perspective, we had this long-standing statement, at least for desktop sites, right, where it, even Google went on record saying, "Well, but if that specific section of content requires user interaction first to kind of pop it down to show it to I don't know what." We might value that less. And yeah. with might value that less, I can't really work. For me as an SEO, that probably means that I am in a disadvantage. So what am I going to do? I'm going to basically say, well, you know, guys, not going to work. This needs to be visible because I need this to contribute to my overall page quality. And therefore, that site ranks. So that changed a bit, right? Because now we have this... We have some of the perceived um, and, and well-known UX patterns where Google said, well, meh, for, for mobile, that might be fine or that, that is actually fine. Don't worry about like hidden elements and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and like with mo the majority of sites, I think we're like at 60, 70% now um, being switched over, even though they kind of extended this, this, uh, this, this deadline into 21 now due to like Corona and whatnot. Um, I think we are more in a situation that, that Google is, I would say honoring the, those some of those patterns a bit more um, and not giving any kind of SEO disadvantage in quotation marks um, mm -hmm. for that. So that discussion with the UX team um, or the CRO guys might be even a bit friendlier than it might have been in the past, I think. Definitely. I can remember so many situations many, many years ago, not many, many years, but a few years ago, exactly yeah. about this topic when we built like massive content landing pages and then we, we received a... Uh, landing page design um, and then it was like okay where is our content here yeah, it's somewhere hidden here and you can slide there <laughs> and put a hover over here and it's like okay you have like 99 percent like hidden content that's not gonna work we need all the content back please and it was like massive discussions between uh between our teams and also the, our our designers so yeah yeah, it's 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 getting better, <laughs> definitely. It, it, it certainly is. It certainly is gonna be getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am gonna because that's a quite nice um, follow up on some of the things. I'm gonna quickly reshare my screen for mm -hmm. some. Um, Maybe in the notes. meantime, 
want them to mention a very short mm -hmm. thing in your presentation you um showed like like one or two slides about uh, or talked about the page speed topic and uh nobody is patient of course um and i thought about the the backlinko study we just showed uh last week on the episode last week. So um, I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely worth for everybody who didn't check the, the uh, small study from Backlinko last week, def definitely makes sense because it pretty much matches what you just said, right? About um, like, like page speed uh, as a factor and nobody has time and which kind of short time frame everybody is spending yeah. on search result pages. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is actually a quite um, a quite nice tie into to this one as well. So the guys over at Systrix, um, mid of the month, published a very very thorough um, study um, based on an over eighteen million domains, where they kind of analyzed uh, those those previously mentioned like Core Web Vitals and matched them against some of the most familiar kind of technology stacks, if that makes any sense. So like from CDNs to CMSs to to hosting, um, etc. There's a whole bunch of um, um, of charts. We're not going to go through all of that, but um, so essentially, um, there's you know uh, they break broke it down by country. There is um, country comparison. There is CMS comparison. Um, uh, it turns out that VIX apparently is uh, the slowest CMS, which made no. me laugh, um, and some other things. So also like the commonly uh, and quite popular systems such as like Shopify, WooCommerce have been compared, programming languages, etc. And there's always you go go down. It works like this. You have a section. Let's just pick one. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is UK. I don't want UK. Sorry, guys. Um, CMS. Yeah. So CMS comparison, right? So they use like all the popular CMSs and then kind of compared um, basically like the system on the left, and then you can see. How many of those sites are somewhat in this acceptable range? If you recall um, earlier, I had this like uh, categorization that Google gives you, like which is like which is good, which is like average, which kind of needs improvement. Um, so this is kind of the breakdown, and you could see well if you if I'm running I don't know the typo three, like there's an eighty-ish percent chance that I'm already good to go. On the other hand, if I use WordPress out of the box, um, you know I might have. Um, I might have some work to do. And this is kind of how the system works uh, with some commentary, same for shop systems. Um, some interesting ones that I've never, well, that I rarely touched actually. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the more popular ones, Shopify, further down, uh, WooCommerce, again, WordPress based, uh, very, very far, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we will be linking this one in uh, kind of the show notes. It's It's a pretty long read, but it gives a great bunch of like, if you see, Great bunch of statistics and numbers there um, that are certainly worth uh, digging into it. If um, if you need help with that, um, if there's anything that we can kind of assist with, we have been doing quite a lot also on the automation side of things. Um, so if you need numbers at a larger scale, maybe want to compare, you know, you against competition and whatnot, uh, feel free to reach out, um, get in touch. We're happy to help. Um, on that note, like two or three more quick housekeeping things um, or just kind of link mentions. There's uh, another really cool article over at the website from the Sitebulb guys, which is, uh, as I'm sure you know, a crawling tool, again, released uh, earlier um, in the week, uh, covering some of the alternatives around um, the structured data testing tool that Google took away, uh, if you recall. Um, or, well, it's taking away. Uh, if you recall, I think three episodes back, mm -hmm. um, we we talked about that as well. Um, and there's a bunch of, it's a long list um, of good alternatives um, and also kind of giving you a bit of idea of, you know, what's, you know, what's behind it, what are the alternatives actually doing, um, what can they do, um who is providing what kind of functionality with the pros and cons um this one i actually mentioned smx right really is the browser plugin which is also really cool um there's a tool structured data linter super old but um still works well and so on and so forth there's a long list uh, this is actually one of my favorites um for presentations the schema visualizer. So if you have to build presentations, then that's something that kind of you can kind of zoom in and zoom out and whatnot. It's really, um, it's really cool. 
So yeah, uh, that's worth a read if you're dealing, and I suppose everyone is at at some point uh, dealing with uh, structured data, then, then that's something that is worth mentioning. And um, another, and that's the last tech topic for today, um, something that we have been, <laughs> actually, I didn't go back into my um, presentations. I can't even recall when I started talking about it. And there were also statements, uh, I think, back in the day from John Mueller. Um, let's just say it took quite a long time for them to make the announcement that Google bot now is kind of, or will finally in November, be able to start crawling some sites. And I mean, we're all curious what some sites is probably going to mean, but uh, some sites over HTTP2. So essentially the um, new protocol version, um, by the way, we are already at HTTP3. So uh, kind of about time to uh, pick that one up. And I mean, of course, why are they making the change? Essentially, it's about connections uh, as most of the time when it comes down to performance. So of course, fewer connections, um, that means fewer resources on the server and therefore um, faster and or more efficient crawling. I think this is kind of what it comes down to. Um, if you are into the technical details, um, there's a whole bunch of like questions in here, um, how you can test it, how do you know if it works? Um, and so on and so forth. I mean, um, it's all in here, as I said, kind of about time. And then the last uh, quick topic that we have. So we talked about um, SMX Munich last episode or the episode before? Uh, two, uh, I think. Two episodes ago, right? Eh? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago. So um, there's a really cool, um, and this is in German, um, but there's a really cool, like, new initiative that they um, just pushed out yesterday. Um, and basically, what they are looking for is new talent, um, new talent on stage, more specifically. So SMX Munich uh, is kind of going back to, um, well, obviously, depending on how Corona and circumstances develop, but um, at least is planned to happen as it would be regularly. Um, so that means end of March. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a hybrid event. Um, so that is not surprising, I suppose. And um, so, yeah, if you want to kind of put your name forward and kind of appear on either the virtual or uh, in person stage at SMX Munich, there is a coaching program. So um, SMX has kind of an advisory board um, where, and I include myself into this one, where we try to help um, with ideas around the program and some, some other things um, left and right. And we feel that there is always a need for new and, well, maybe exciting topics that we haven't seen, especially from people that have not been on stage, that's always very pleasant and really cool to see like new people there. And and therefore, um, Rising Media, as the events organizer, decided to kind of set up this initiative. So basically, if you are interested, then um, you find it on Facebook or um, we will link like this coaching program here. So essentially, it gives a bit of background. Um, and there is then a form that you need to fill out um, kind of with your personal details, a bit about you, um, why uh, and how. So it's it's relatively straightforward um but uh, i think this is something really cool to to introduce even more diversity on stage uh, yeah. in, in every sense and also give like new talent um a a face and b if you are not really well if you're not feeling confident yet i think some people have been doing this for quite a while and there's a lot of people that are very happy to help and share you know their thoughts their take on what you want to present, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a really cool opportunity um, to speak at one of the most, I would say, um, reputable conferences around the globe. So yeah, go for it. I mean, this is probably my, uh, my, my pitch for you guys. Um, if, you wanna, <laughs> if you ever want to speak at SMX, I think this is probably the best chance. Um, yes. And it's worth to, it. To do so. mm -hmm. It's Right. I mean, yeah, right. So, I mean, you have been there for the last three years, right? Yeah. Uh, three or two. I'm not, not sure. I think three years. Anyhow, either way. But yeah. So, um, 
not uh, you're not qualifying as a newcomer anymore but uh, oh. I, you know, I but I, it's I mean it's good that you have the same take right I mean I I've been like I've been doing this for so long that just sometimes you're like a bit biased maybe but uh, it's I mean it's great that you kind of agree and I think you said it at your at your SMX recap definitely as well. I mean I mean I mean so many people with like beautiful minds let's say and so much knowledge but there are also so many people who are extremely afraid of of taking that step for the first conference yeah. because uh, i mean it's it's yeah uh very exciting to speak in front of so many people and um i i had the same when i was uh visiting the uh seo com i guess it was, mm -hmm. uh, where um i saw so many intelligent people on stage and i was so afraid because i thought okay maybe they are like like so intelligent people and experienced people i cannot be on the same stage as they are so mm -hmm. um, i think um that's that's the major part and super important for uh, or a great op uh, opportunity to get something like this this coaching um from the smx to to just learn from the best let's say yeah yeah yeah, yeah i also i think it's a really it's a really cool idea so curious what uh, what comes out of it um we will keep you posted yes and we're already at 45 minutes so um time flew by um and in the spirit of doing things better as we said we cut it a bit shorter so not the full hour so this means we are already at the end uh for this week's uh, episode of pk on air um i hope you guys enjoyed it um took some bits and pieces away from it um if you have any feedback we would be delighted to receive that in either comments uh, or like on the show note pages that will be available obviously as well so you can leave your comment there you can message us um, on twitter or um, wherever you feel like um, we'd be delighted to read you that said um, we are off for this week uh, yeah. which is a fantastic rest of it and uh, hope to see you guys soon um at the latest next week uh same time great see you next week bye bye, bye, -bye.